It's Friday, June 24. In the headlines, toll rates could be going up. UNICEF saddened at Clarendon killings. Regionally, Grenada has a new prime minister. Further afield, the United States Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. And in sports, Jamaican sprint stars heating up the tracks at the national championships. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Simone Absalom Gale. Highway 2000 is seeking increases in toll rates. The proposed increases range between 9.09% and 26.67%. The Highway Authority is seeking to provide a discount to motorists who use the Portmore and Spanish Town toll plazas after their 10th trip. The adjustments are likely to take effect next week Saturday on July 2. Here are the proposed changes. Here are the proposed toll discounts. No discounts were proposed for Class 3 vehicles. The notices of the proposed increases were posted on June 24 and members of the public have five days within which to provide feedback. Jamaica's Foreign Affairs Minister, Kamina Johnson-Smith, has lost her bid to oust Baroness Patricia Scotland as Commonwealth Secretary General. She narrowly missed out on the top post in a 27-24 vote in Rwanda on Friday. In a tweet, Minister Without Portfolio in the Office of the Prime Minister with Responsibility for Information, Robert Morgan, says, Kamina did very well. We are proud of her. End quote. Johnson Smith also tweeted saying, quote, thanking all the countries and people who supported me in this journey. As I said to many of you, if I didn't pull through, God wasn't ready for me to leave Jamaica yet. Much love always. I continue to serve. And of course, sincere congratulations to Baroness Scotland. Hashtag one love. End quote. Hundreds of people lined up outside Hart College of Beauty Services campus at Hope Road on Thursday in response to an invitation to apply for a job in the cruise industry. Some people said they were waiting in line from as early as 4 a.m. By mid-morning, the line of job seekers snaked out about 250 meters from the Hart Campus gate on Hope Road onto Southermere Road down to Constant Spring Road at the intersection with South Odeon Avenue. Uh, we'll come out here just to get a job, you know, just to travel abroad, just to get the experience. But as you clearly see, we want the line to move, but it really not moving. I'm out here from about 8 o'clock this morning. I'm here from 6 o'clock this morning and I go I get the experience to come in our job fair and I just want this opportunity for my five kids them that their life can set free. We're there early this morning and they're going to go to rate them people and they're going with good things in Jamaica. Look on the line paper. And you only need to do some more things like this. I'm not lie. I think it's a great opportunity for students or even people that are unemployed at this moment right now. I mean, there's a lot of people here and everybody wants to get through. Marketing and Communications Manager at Heart NSTA, Juliana Patrick, says the agency had advertised the job fair on its social media pages. And while most people appeared surprised by the response, he wasn't. He explains that it is not unusual for advertised jobs to be oversubscribed. He says it is a good benchmark to see the interest in a particular industry. United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, wants the government to move faster to implement agreed plans to protect children from violence. In a statement following the recent killing of 31-year-old Kamisha Wright and her four children, UNICEF says the organization is, quote, saddened and deeply alarmed, end quote, by the continued upsurge in violence in Jamaica and particularly about reports of child victims. In a press release issued on June 22, UNICEF says, quote, 
This horrific and brutal attack against the most vulnerable members of our society has shocked the entire nation, end quote. It continues saying, quote, it also highlights the need for the government of Jamaica to accelerate commitments made to protect our children under the 2019 National Plan of Action for an integrated response to children and violence, including investing in programs addressing conflict resolution, anger management, safety in the homes and community, and developing and improving partnerships to strengthen community resilience in relation to violence, end quote. UNICEF made it clear that it stands ready to assist the government in this effort. 23-year-old Rashane Barnett, who is a cousin of the deceased family, is in police custody as a suspect in the case that has sparked national condemnation. Designers of floats, costumes and music trucks are invited to show off their skills at the upcoming Jamaica 60 Emancipation and Independence Celebrations. The Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport is inviting talented Jamaicans to submit designs for a float parade to reflect the Jamaican experience. The theme for the float parade is reigniting a nation for peace, love and unity. Interested persons can submit their designs in JPEG or PDF format via email to mcges2021 at gmail.com or call 876-553-0550 or 876-978-7654 to register or seek further information. Persons whose designs are selected in the categories of float, costume group, and music truck will receive an honorarium of $200,000, $100,000, and $50,000, respectively. This week on Living Healthy, we look at hidden sugar and issues surrounding childhood obesity. Professor Samuels is inviting you to be a sugar sleuth. Before buying a product, one should read the label and look out for added sugar and it won't always be called sugar. It's often described as evaporated cane juice, fruit juice concentrate, brown rice syrup, malt syrup, corn syrup, date syrup, barley malt, or galactose or glucose. Hidden sugar is a term that is used when they are talking about foods. And sugar comes disguised with many different names. Maltose and fructose and sucrose and corn, corn syrup and all of these things. And so a lot of times when you look on the label of a product, you don't see the word sugar. You will see something else. And if you don't know all the disguises for sugar, you might not realize that it is in fact sugar. She explains that human eating habits have changed over the years and some of these habits put people at risk of non-communicable diseases like childhood obesity. Okay, so what happened is that say 50 or 100 years ago, the main problems were communicable diseases. Polio, diphtheria, tet tetanus, tuberculosis. Over the years, immunization, yes, the same immunization like we get for COVID, mm -hmm. Immunization against all of these diseases have changed the face of the disease pattern and also allowed people to live much longer because children used to die a lot in early days from all of these preventable diseases. So we have kind of conquered that, but at the same time that we did that, we went into what we call the nutrition transition. At that time long ago, we used to eat what came straight out of the earth. Now we are eating out of tin and from the fast food, and it's everywhere. French fries with three meals a day. Those that change in the diet culture is what is causing our steep increase in the risk factors, especially obesity, and also in the actual diseases too, especially in children. Childhood obesity is a problem. It is a serious medical condition that affects children and adolescents. It's particularly troubling because the extra pounds often start children on the path to health problems such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Child obesity can also lead to poor self-esteem and depression. So what can parents do about it? Again, I want to go back to the drinks. 
give your children water to drink. That is one of the most important things that we can start with, and it's doable. It's doable, you know what I'm saying? Because that sugar in the drink is very dangerous. Because when sugar just gets it in a liquid into your, into your stomach, it's absorbed immediately, and you get a sugar spike, and then the insulin comes and then you get a sugar crash. So the sugar goes down below the normal level, and then you want another soda to bring the sugar back up. So we really, we need to get out of that sweet drink thing. Time now for our regular market updates. Daniel Rodney is at the business desk. Jamaica currently runs on internal combustion engines and hybrid vehicles, but for the past few months, there has been talks of incorporating and transitioning to electric vehicles. Raquel Robinson has the details. Head of Sales and Marketing at Toyota Jamaica, Michael McGrain, says that currently there is a high demand for EVs, but there is also a low supply due to manufacturing issues. Current affairs has resulted in the demand for vehicles to increase exponentially. What is happening in Eastern Europe, along with the chip shortage, has resulted in a very low supply across all automotive manufacturers. This low supply in, with, the, with the increase in demand has resulted in equilibrium being way off from supply and demand perspective. Within Jamaica, we have seen inquiries about hybrid technology, which is HEV, hybrid electric technology, increasing exponentially alongside electric vehicle requests. Now, uh, our position from a Toyota perspective, we've been generating and manufacturing hybrid technology for the past 20 years. It's not new to Toyota, but it's new to Jamaica. And since January of this year, we've seen inquiries and sales hit an all-time high for hybrid vehicles. Our hybrid Corolla Cross and our hybrid at RAV4 have been really just, the demand has been exponential. There's none available on the island right now. All which arrive at the end of each month have already been taken. And we are, we are seeing an increase in sales. However, supply is really the main restrictor of what's happening right now. When asked if he thought the transition to electric vehicles was a good move, he gave a resounding absolutely and explains the ways in which a country would benefit. Absolutely. Technology advancements are always good, right? It helps out the environment, it helps out the consumer's pockets, it's just all in all it's a good thing. But we have to be realistic. In Jamaica, the new car market is made up of between six and 7,000 units per annum. The used car market is upwards of 30,000. Will we ever see, or when will we see numbers like that in an electric format? We're talking tens of years. It's, it's going to be a long time. Is it good for the market? Of course. Uh, you know, we should be protecting our environment from a tourism perspective. We need to preserve the beauty of this country. And one way of doing that is reducing our carbon footprint. And the best way to do that in the short term, I believe, is to move to hybrid, and in the long term, to move to electric. While this move may be energy efficient, there are thoughts on what that would mean for its citizens. Aaron Smith, founder of Millennium Auto Sales, says that for a proper transition, the government first needs to take the time to educate citizens as it will affect their lives. The number one thing I think the government will have to take um, a, a role big role, not government alone, the private sector, but I think government as the leaders who make the decision and make the, the laws, um, they're, they're first going to have to educate. We're going to have to educate our people. Yeah. And education is going to be broad because the, the cars are going to affect the way we do business, the way we live. It's going to affect everything in our life. Just like our motor vehicle you know, affect everything in your life, it's going to continue to do so and it's even going to impact it more. So we can't go away from electricity vehicles. We're going to have to go there. So the first aspect of it, we've got to educate our people. Once they have the necessary information, Mr. Smith is encouraging persons to get involved in the decision-making process and not just going along with the whims of the government. What I think we could more do is to get the stakeholder, get people more involved, get 
all the stakeholders involved in the decision process and then we can take it from there instead of one person making a decision and then everybody follow following i think we can, we, we must move away from that um that was maybe 300 years ago when uh, the queen make a decision and everybody has to follow i think we must now have everybody at the table and we can make more informed decision that will affect all our lives it's not the government life alone it's all of our lives so i think all of us has to have a, have a stake in it and all of us must come to the table and have a stake in, in, in the say of where the country go from, from here. Reporting for PBCJ News, I'm Raka Robinson. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Thursday, June 23, the US dollar sold for an average of $151.98. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $117.26. The pound sterling traded for $185.97. And the euro sold for an average of $162.82. The following reflects the movement of the JSE indices in Thursday's trading session. The JSE index advanced by 2,365 points to close at over 300,000 units. The junior market index declined by 23 points to close at over 4,000 units. The combined market index advanced by 2,003 points to close at over 300,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 3,067 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 102 stocks of which 46 advanced, 47 declined and 9 traded firm. Stocks Advance 4, 1834 Investments Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Stocks Declined 4, Barita Investments Limited, Berger Pains Jamaica Limited, and Blue Power Group Limited. Trading firm were JMB Group 7.25% Preferring Shares, KLE Group Limited, and Mailpack Group Limited. The following companies represent the overall volume leaders. Dollar Financial Services Limited with over 12 million units, Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 5 million units, and Mailbike Group Limited with over 4 million units. In regional stocks in Trinidad and Tobago, Pico Investment Fund was the only active security with over 4,000 shares being traded. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Government of Barbados Bond Series B was the sole security trading over 100,000 shares. In market data for oil, oil rose supported by tight supply, although crude was heading for a second weekly fall on concern that rising interest rates could push the world economy into recession. Brent crude was up $1.68 or 1.5% at $111.73 a barrel and the West Texas Intermediate crude gained $1.84 or 1.8% to $106.11 a barrel. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, Grenada's National Democratic Congress, NDC, has won nine of the 15 seats, removing the new national party from government. That's according to preliminary results. Retaining his seat is Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell, uh, who called the general election ahead of the constitutional March 2023 deadline. NDC leader and Prime Minister-elect Dickon Mitchell, who took over the opposition party in October last year, defeated Foreign Affairs Minister Oliver Joseph by a margin of 4,414 to 2,742 votes. In a message posted on its website, the NDC said, quote, We are overwhelmed with gratitude and stand humbled before the Lord or God and you, the people of Grenada, Caracou and Petite Martinique. It continued, quote, thank you from the bottom of each and every one of our hearts. This victory is not ours, but yours, end quote. During the 2013 and 2018 elections, NDC lost back-to-back 15-0 to Keith Mitchell's NNP. In the next three to five years, Barbados government will be out of the sugar industry. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Security, Indar Weir, says the government can no longer continue to put money into the industry if Barbados is to reach food and nutritional security. By the start of the next sugar crop, the industry could be in private sector hands. The minister says government is moving to provide support for the industry and meetings with private sector stakeholders 
stakeholders are at an advanced stage. We are well on the way in terms of the um, work that is being done to transition the sugar industry. The consultants are to come back to us um, very shortly um, with their findings and we're going to go full steam ahead with the transitioning process so that by next year's sugar harvest um, this process should have already begun and then um, the final closure to all this should be somewhere between the end of 2025-27. In Guyana, the Labor Ministry has recovered approximately $13 million owed to employees for 2022 in wages, annual leave, overtime and severance payments. Minister Joseph Hamilton told DPI that most of these cases are from private security companies who refused to formally terminate their employees to avoid paying their remuneration as stipulated in the Termination of Employment and Severance Pay Act. The Labor Minister stated firmly that the ministry will not allow such acts to continue. He says, quote, people will have to be paid their monies and sometimes I intervene in these matters and I say that you have two choices, either pay or I'll call the press conference to decide and that has worked so far, end quote. Since assuming office in August 2020, the government has taken several steps to ensure the rights of workers are protected. This includes sensitization workshops with companies where the country's labor laws in relation to workers' rights and other aspects are addressed. In the Bahamas, at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, Prime Minister Philip Davis once again publicly took on the lack of swift response to climate change. Jerome Sawyer takes a look at the role the Prime Minister has in addressing climate change. Prime Minister Philip Davis first took on the issue at the UN Conference on Climate Change in November, COP26. In a few months, that conference reconvenes at COP27. But has anything really changed? At the recent Summit of the Americas, he again challenged the world to do something to tackle the problem. He came to the Commonwealth Heads of Government in Rwanda even more determined. I, I intend to get ours. I intend to get them to pay for what they've done to us. Conservative estimates from the Prime Minister put the recovery from climate change events at 45% of national debt. His speech at the Business Forum here on Wednesday was a call for support of the Commonwealth Blue Charter for solving ocean-related problems, as well as UN sustainable goals on ocean preservation. Globally, we think that we are continuing to, to sensitize the, the high emitters, that when they, the, the greenhouse gas they emit in their countries don't stay in their country. But did it work? He also remains optimistic. My voice has been has joined in the chorus for action, and I'm, I'm seeing the needle move just a little, um, and um, and and you know we'll be discussing it as part of the agenda here. But this week, Prime Minister Davis's voice joined in a chorus of Commonwealth leaders calling for decisive action. Tackling climate change will require the most significant political, social and economic effort that the world has ever seen. Here in Kigali, we can choose to set the tone and shape the quality of that effort. In sports, reigning world 100-meter champion Shellyanne Fraser-Price backed up her world-leading equaling 10.67 seconds from Saturday in Paris with a 10.70 seconds clocking in the heat of 100 meters to be the fastest qualifier for Friday's semifinals at the national championships. Fraser Price was followed home by Brianna Williams in 10.98 and Ramona Burchell in 11.16. 2011 World 100m champion Johan Blake ran his fastest time since 2017 as he clocked 9.93 seconds to be the fastest qualifier to Friday's semifinals of the men's 100m at the National Senior Championships at the National Stadium. Blake was followed by Kimar Bailey Cole in a season's best 10.06 and Nigel Ellis in 10.10. World long jump champion Tajay Gale also made progress from that heat in 10.13 seconds.
Jamaica's fastest man so far this year, Obik Seville, was also in sub second form, winning his heat in 9.98 seconds, beating Jelani Walker 10.07 and Jazeel Murphy 10.18. The action continues at the Jamaica National Stadium until June 26. Blaze T20 champions Jamaica will meet Barbados in Saturday's final of the Cricket West Indies Women's Super 50 Cup after beating Guyana by eight wickets in their semi-final contest at Providence Stadium. After the game was delayed by rain, seam bowler Chanel Henry gave the Jamaicans the early advantage, picking up four wickets in the first six overs. Openers Mandy Manguru and Lashana Toussaint were both dismissed without scoring, followed by Shermaine Campbell 5 and Shanita Grimond 2, whom both fell in the fifth over. Guyana lost their last five wickets for four runs as they were bowled out for 23 in 11.2 overs. Vanessa Watts accounted for four of the last five wickets to end with outstanding figures of 5 for 5, while Henry had a 5 for 18. Jamaica eased home with 27 runs, not before losing Rashida Williams for 12 and Kanisha Ferron for 6. Saturday's final should start around 1.30 p.m. Jamaica time. Emmanuel Christian Academy, ECA, Norbrook Strikers and Eagles Football Academy were winners in the respective age group categories for the inaugural Yardi Sports Pediashore Youth Soccer Cup held at Emmett Park at St. George's College last Saturday. ECA won the under-8 category, Norbrook Striker won the under-11 category, while Eagles Football Academy soared to victory in the under-14 category. In the under-8 category, ECA easily defeated Genesis Academy 5-1. In the under-14 category, St. Andrew Technical High used the opportunity to give their team more opportunities for competitive action, splitting their team into two. But it was Eagles Academy who won the final 3-1. Speaking on the sidelines was Technical Director of the Genesis Football Academy, Andrew Edwards, who shared his thoughts about the tournament. These kinds of tournaments are more than needed in Jamaica. Um, it would be really nice to be able to play these kinds of tournaments every weekend. Um, so we really want to salute Yardi Sports and Peter Shore for coming together to make this a possibility. Um, the organization is quite good. And, you know, I think if I had one complaint, I would have said the size of the field is a little bit smaller than expected. But we have had a very good experience so far. Um, I am personally delighted about some of the performances from some of my players. You know, we've been working on a few things and I see them coming to fruition and I'm very happy about that. Result-wise, um, we got two victories, one at each level so far. And um, the others would have been ended in defeats for us. But quite frankly, for Genesis, the results are not the most important thing at this stage. We want to look at some performance indicators and we are very pleased that all our players have demonstrated that some of the things that we are teaching, they are taking on board. And for that alone, we are very, very happy and pleased. CEO of Yardi Sports, Dwayne Richards, says although there were a few hiccups, he was pleased with the proceedings. The feedback that we've gotten so far from the clubs is good and you know, it says a lot about what we've been able to put on today and what it is that we're trying to achieve. Our interest is to ensure that we recapture the base. We lost a lot of the base when we had this lockdown for two years. A lot of the children found other things to do with their time. We need to get back the base of Jamaica's football if we're going to be able to create talent out of the country and not always have to be shopping overseas. So our, our role and responsibility in the growth and the development of football is to be able to do something like this. The weekend is here and it's time to find out what's happening in the entertainment world. Hey Alicia, what's up? Simone Girly, we have some niceness this week. Hope you're ready. So this week's show, let me tell you, Dancehall Queen Spice puts another accomplishment under her belt. New music and lots more. So join us at 8.30 p.m. on Saturdays on PBC Jamaica with me, of course, Alicia, and just continue to big up you. Thanks, Alicia, for those headlines. Check out tonight's episode of PBCJ Presents as we discuss taxes. Why do we pay them? Do you know how it's calculated? Watch PBCJ Presents at 8.30 p.m. on our social media pages. That's the news on PBCJ right now. Have a safe weekend.